All right, guys, this is just a very quick narration uh, of the uh, PowerPoint that goes over uh, proposals. And I just wanted to put this out there for you guys. I realized earlier in class, that's what actually was being referred to. Um, so my apologies for the oversight. So I'll get that done real fast. Okay, let me just one second here. I'll get my screen shared and we will get, uh, get rolling. Okay, so an introduction to research proposals. So essentially, you know, what is a research proposal? A research proposal is the preparatory plan, right? That describes all the elements of a research project. Uh, this is essentially where you are attempting to convince, right, a group of stakeholders um, to, to provide funding for your work or for your research, right? So ultimately these, re these research proposals can come in different forms. Right, and there are different projects that require proposals. So we have quality improvement projects. We have, you know, uh, proposals that are be that are based on the thesis type uh, of, of scientific method. Right, and we have non-experimental or qualitative projects, and then we have clinical trials. Right, so all of these things, all of these project types, uh, generally speaking, would be run by, you know, a uh, a board in the in, in the grant process uh, to provide funding. Right, so the first type of uh, proposal that we'll cover is the proposal that essentially follows the thesis method, right? And so this is most, um, resembles most, right, the scientific method, right? So we'll essentially have a title, uh, abstract, introduction, right, statement of the problem, um, and then a lit review and a review of the, of the methods. So, all right, so the title, really important uh, to, you know, Try to be as specific as possible with the title, right? So ultimately, when we're attempting to, you know, try to determine, right, how, uh, what wording to use, right, with the title of our, of our research proposal, it's best to be as specific as possible, right? And we can do that. Uh, we can do that a couple of ways. You know, within healthcare, we often utilize the PICO method uh, to, to accomplish that, to accomplish uh, the precise statement of a problem, right, by defining you know, a population of interest and intervention, right? A comparison and then ultimately an outcome of interest, right? And so obviously uh, in, the, in the event that we're trying to make a very a specific statement, uh, we then do so obviously by adequately describing populations, uh, you know, and all those types of things. So it's, it's best to be as specific as possible. In the event of a quality improvement type project, right? We need to make sure that our goals uh, meet what are called the SMART criteria, right? So they need to be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-related. So with the introduction, right, not only do you have to justify the need for your study, uh, but you've got to, you've got to use a uh, language that essentially kind of avoids the curse of expertise. You know, that was something that was actually in the reading that was posted uh, for week three, right? So the curse of expertise, you know, we already know, you know, this is something that uh, for many of us that, you know, have uh, a background or an expertise in something, you know, whether that be for me, you know, athletic training or, or any other type of discipline, often we have a, more of a difficult time breaking down concepts into simple language, right? And so that is what is known as the curse of expertise. And that can provide essentially a barrier um, to the uh, proposal that we're trying to get approved. So avoiding the curse of, of expertise and writing in a language that is simple and plain uh, for the reader to understand is of primary importance. It's the purpose statement, right? So obviously at the end of the introduction is where the purpose statement goes. Uh, we need to work on obviously identifying a problem that is, that is exact, right? And we talked about, you know, utilizing very specific language before uh, to be able to articulate that appropriately. Um, you know, we need to really avoid trying to narrow things down as, as, as specifically as possible. You know, we don't want to uh, provide, uh, you know, a problem that, you know, is, is, is too broad to be solved. For example, if we were looking at, you know, access to, you know, maybe health insurance within, you know, specific populations, um, that may be kind of a broad question because there could be varying varying factors, right, that um, influence the, the presence or absence of healthcare coverage, uh, obviously through health insurance, right, um, in those communities, you know, versus communities that are, uh, you know, maybe a little bit higher on the socioeconomic uh, kind of totem pole, so to speak. Um, but if we were to narrow it down and say, 
in looking at you know communities where uh, socioeconomic status is, is potentially more limited, and then comparing those um, with potentially middle class communities, you know, looking at the problem of health insurance coverage, potentially in children, right, that are ages 12 to 18, what proportion of those children have primary medical insurance coverage in lower socioeconomic status communities uh, when compared to communities uh, that are, you know, middle class. Right. So we need to, be, but, you know, in, in expressing that, we need to be very concise, yet use wording that will thoroughly communicate what it is that we are trying to uh, solve. So the hypothesis, right? So obviously the hypothesis is your, is your statement, right, of, of what you believe the case to be. So using our previous example, you know, we, we believe that Access to healthcare coverage, you know, through the medium of health insurance will be less common in those communities of lower socioeconomic status. Um, and so we would state that as our hypothesis. Um, so ultimately, you know, we need to also use definitions, um, you know, that are, you know, easily definable and or operational definitions. What an operational definition is, is defining a concept or a word in a way that a reader will understand. For example, Okay, we're going to use the term uh, healthcare access. Okay, that can mean a lot of things. It can mean, do you have a primary care doctor? Do you have, you know, health insurance? Is there a hospital within two or three blocks of your house? Excuse me. So those are all things that uh, that could be, right, uh, you know, kind of defined within the term healthcare access. <clears throat> Excuse me. So... We need to operationally define that as we've done in the previous slide as, you know, having primary health care, you know, having primary health insurance. Um, so, you know, another example, you know, when we use the term athlete exposure, like what is an athlete exposure? Well, an athlete exposure is, is defined very, very precisely uh, in the sports epidemiology literature as one practice session or competition per, you know, uh, per session. So one athlete participating in one practice or competition. Right. And, you know, not only that, you know, in using, you know, this very precise language, how will you also ensure uh, that your study is significant, that you are attempting to convince the reader of your proposal that your, that your study will solve and or will investigate a significant problem? So, you know, obviously, as a researcher, you know, you've got to make sure that it draws your audience in. That, that the way that you state your question and your problem is something that is important to people, right? It is that, that is important to uh, stakeholders while obviously appropriately utilizing the data that you have available, okay? So making sure that your question is based on, you know, relevant science and science that's well conducted is, is of primary importance. Um, and you may accomplish that by utilizing secondary sources such as systematic reviews and others. So clearly, you know, when we talk about the difference between systematic reviews and literature reviews, uh, systematic reviews obviously are going to follow a very specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. Generally speaking, they also have a team of researchers and or of reviewers that are deciding that exclusion and inclusion criteria uh, that will also decide which papers are to be included and which are to be excluded. Okay. Um, where on the other hand, you know, a regular literature review is going to be leaning heavily on primary sources. Uh, and it is, you know, examining primary studies uh, and or, you know, other topics, experimental studies and, and things like that to be able to develop uh, an impression and or literature on a topic or describe a problem. Okay, so ultimately, you know, when we look at kind of an example, this is actually an example of a narrative review, right? So ultimately, we chose to pursue, and this is a, a paper that I worked on during my doctoral work, right? We chose to pursue a theme, right? And or tell a story, right? So we weren't necessarily interested in, in inclusion exclusion criteria, right? But what we were interested in is exploring the literature related to a theme, right? So for example, you know, we were really interested in looking at the history of primary care in the United States, specifically what it meant to be a general practitioner and what the definition of primary care uh, is. And then obviously looking at future directions. So we weren't interested um, in, you know, in systematically including and in excluding specific papers. Uh, we were specifically interested in constructing a narrative, a narrative and a story. 
And so these are some of the primary sources that were utilized in the literature review. Uh, you know, so we have the Mills report as one, and then a report uh, commissioned uh, by the, the uh, called the Graduate Education of Positions. Um, so those are the primary sources that were used. Okay, the method, the method section. So when you, when you're writing a proposal, this is essentially the last section of your proposal. Um, and this is where you will essentially share uh, with your readers, with the people that will be hopefully funding your, your research, what exactly it is, how it is that you're planning to study this, okay? The subjects you will include, inclusion and exclusion criteria, right? Uh, how you will collect your data, the instrumentation, um, whether this will be an experimental or non-experimental study, and then how you potentially plan to analyze your data, okay? But this is essentially where the method, where, where the proposal would end. Okay, so ultimately, um, you know, when, when we look at, you know, quality improvement projects, you know, we, as we seek to identify a problem within that project, right? Uh, we plan to essentially, uh, you know, formulate a plan to address it. We carry out the plan, we study the outcome, and then we, and then we act, right? So um, we utilized a couple of theories, right? Uh, in, in this quality improvement project, looking at things like the theory of plan behavior, attempting to make an impact on attitudes uh, toward concussion reporting, subjective norms, right? And then perceived behavioral control, uh, meaning, you know, trying to kind of give the locus of control back to uh, the patient, the student athlete, and take it out of the hands of coaches and people that may be placing undue pressure on the student athlete. Okay, so we use very specific criteria um, in this quality improvement project, uh, looking at, you know, attitudes and beliefs on, on concussion reporting. Uh, we use what are called the steep criteria, right? So ultimately this project um, needed to be safe, right? It needed to actually increase uh, the level of, of safety by encouraging reporting of concussion symptoms, right? This quality improvement uh, program sought to advance equity. And by doing so, right, it made the, edu the educational material available to everyone, regardless of, you know, access to healthcare, regardless of, you know, many, many other factors are asked of medical history and or, uh, you know, personal or, or, you know, family beliefs or anything like that, that might've imposed a barrier, right? So this was presented to, to everyone. Um, it's patient-centered. So this is, you know, also educational material uh, that was, you know, that took into account uh, social and environmental factors that people routinely engage with, like pressure from coaches, pressure from, you know, parents and those types of things. Um, and it sought to, you know, also communicate different ideas in regards to level of uh, level of risk uh, with, you know, different uh, concussion histories. So, uh, as far as quality improvement, the team, right? So, there were athletic trainers, uh, obviously, uh, physicians supervising uh, the, you know, us as athletic trainers in this project. Um, the athletic department at the university that I, that I was employed in previously, uh, you know, helped with program implementation. And then we had, you know, surveys or outcome measures to, to evaluate the efficacy of the program. So uh, that's a quick overview of uh, essentially research proposals. I hope that that is helpful. So uh, that should be everything for exam number one. Hope you guys are doing uh, well and that this uh, served you guys well in, in studying and preparing. Thanks, guys.